For nearly two centuries, societies have weighed the merits of free market capitalism and socialism. Debates continue over which system maximizes prosperity and better promotes human flourishing. Free market capitalism decentralizes economic decisions, giving individuals control over what to produce, how much to charge, and what to buy. Their decisions are informed by market prices, which convey important information about scarcity and consumer value. Proponents contend that capitalism delivers the best economic outcomes by giving individuals incentives to create and produce. Critics, on the other hand, point to the persistence of poverty in market economies and rising inequality as proof that capitalism fails to deliver broad-based prosperity. They maintain that this inequality ultimately gives the rich disproportionate economic and political power. In contrast, socialism grants the government the authority to make most economic decisions. The government chooses how to allocate scarce resources based upon what it determines to be most useful to society as a whole. Proponents argue that socialism ensures society's resources are fairly distributed. Critics claim that socialism fails to give people proper economic incentives to innovate and produce, which ultimately reduces economic opportunities for all. Opponents further argue that socialism's powerful central governments become autocratic and threaten political freedom. So which system is better for humanity? For as long as this question has been asked, the debate all too often devolves into name-calling and emotional arguments that fail to advance the discussion. And yet, it is imperative that we keep asking. The Human Prosperity Project at the Hoover Institution seeks to overcome these preconceptions. It employs analysis of free market capitalism and socialism and its many variants to assess how each system affects human flourishing. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the premiere of a new speaker series of the Hoover Institution focusing on socialism and free market capitalism called the Human Prosperity Project. I'm Scott Atlas, the Robert Wesson Senior Fellow at Hoover Institution. My research at Hoover focuses on the impact of government and the private sector on access, quality, and pricing in healthcare and the key economic issues related to the future of technology-based medical advances and innovation. Earlier this year, the Human Prosperity Project on Socialism and Free Market Capitalism was launched at Hoover. The goal of the project is to investigate in an objective and scholarly manner the historical record to assess the consequences for human welfare, individual liberty, and interactions between nations of various economic systems ranging from pure socialism to free market capitalism. This project is research-based with educational and policy-oriented outputs that include long-form essays, short videos, commentaries, and now the speaker series. Currently, there are about 30 Hoover Fellows participating in this important project. Uh, my colleague Ed Lazier and I have the privilege to serve as co-chairs. To launch the speaker series today, I'm being joined by my two esteemed Hoover colleagues, Ed Lazier and Condoleezza Rice. Ed Lazier is the Morris Arnold and Nana Jean Cox Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Davies Family Professor of Economics at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. Ed is a labor economist and served at the White House from 2006 to 2009 where he was chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Before coming to Stanford, he taught at the University of Chicago, uh, my medical school alma mater. Uh, Condoleezza Rice is the Thomas and Barbara Stevenson Senior Fellow on Public Policy at the Hoover Institution. From January 2005 to 2009, uh, Condi served as the 66th Secretary of State of the United States. She also served as President George W. Bush's National Security Advisor from January 2001 to 2005. Dr. Rice has held multiple positions at Stanford University, including Professor at the Graduate School of Business, Provost, and Professor of Political Science. And uh, we're delighted to say that on September 1, she will take the office as Director of the Hoover Institution. Welcome, everyone. To start off, uh, Condi, the Human Prosperity Project is all about understanding how different economic and political systems affect well-being. 
It's about using research and objective analysis to document the outcomes of these various systems. Why do you think it's so important to do this sort of investigation in today's world? Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Scott and, and Eddie, for the leadership you've shown on this project. I think it's right at the core of what we need to examine uh, these days. Uh, we are a country that it seems to me is increasingly data free in what we, uh, what we look at. People have axioms, they have beliefs, they have opinions. But it's our responsibility as, uh, as academics, as people who are dedicated to finding the truth wherever it leads us, to really take a hard look at the data, to set up our questions in ways that allow us to have falsifiable hypotheses, and uh, not just to assume anything. And so uh, I'm very grateful that we have this project underway uh, because there's a lot of opinion, a lot of heat around these issues. Not much light because people aren't really willing to look at the, the facts. Great. Well, let me start by uh, posing a few questions to you, Condi, and then we'll take some questions from the audience if you're willing. Um, so uh, let's get started. The topics that we're covering in the project are wide ranging. They cover a variety of different areas. Uh, all the way from basic economic performance to liberty and freedom, politics, international relations, environment, health, education, just to name a few. Um, all of those seem important, but I'm wondering, uh, could you focus on a couple of areas and explain to us how understanding those might be beneficial to public policy? Well, first of all, let me just say that I think there is one essential element that is important to all of the policy areas that you mentioned. And that's the importance of liberty, the importance of individual liberty. Uh, if one thinks about uh, property rights, or if one thinks about the environment, or one thinks about uh, economic progress, one thinks about educational progress, uh, we do know that in uh, societies where uh, the freedom, the, the rights of the individual are not protected, uh, that we actually don't get particularly good outcomes. Now, why is that? Uh, that's, I, as you know, I spent a lot of my life studying um, a country that was born on uh, the premise uh, from each according to his talents to each according to his needs. That was the core of socialism. One thing that we know is that's only worked at gunpoint because it actually turns out not to be very uh, incentivizing to people to say, you can work as hard as you possibly can according to your talents, but we, and then the question becomes who is the we, are going to determine what your needs are. And that's why that system has never produced uh, particularly good outcomes. If you take, for example, uh, questions about the environment. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, there used to be a sense that because these were collectivist notions of government, the environment would be protected better than if we had uh, capitalism uh, looking after the environment. I can tell you that the shock of what we found in the late 1980s and in the early 1990s in countries like Hungary, where the degradation of the uh, environment, just chemical spills of military materials just left out in the open. Uh, if you look at, do uh, you know that the, actually the first uh, kind of uh, experiment with a little bit of democracy in the Soviet Union was around a, uh, an, an NGO that came together around the pollution of Lake Baikal because the pollution had been so significant and the government had done nothing about it. We can keep going, Chernobyl, you, you name it. Now, why is that? It's because what you have in a free society is multiple points at which those kinds of activities are going to be brought out into the open, whether it's by elected officials or a free press or individual citizens who are going to get together and say, that is wrong, 
free societies actually will be more protective of something like the environment than those socialist or collective, collectivists. So that's just one example of why when you protect freedom and you protect liberty and you protect everything from press freedom to uh, people who can question a, a corporation through shareholder uh, activities, you're going to get outcomes that are different than if you uh, depend on the we in that collective. And of course, the we always turns out to be a very small number of people at the top who make those decisions. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, Milton Friedman, um, one of our illustrious, of course, late colleague, but uh, probably one of the greatest economists of the 20th century, if not the greatest. Uh, I remember him uh, having a debate with uh, then Phil Donahue. Uh, some of us remember that, uh, that show. And he said, yeah, tell me where all these angels are that are going to run the government and the economy with complete altruism in their hearts. And that's actually the, you know, the problem that, that we see in those kinds of societies. Let me turn to something that's um, more directly in, in your area, although obviously you cover many areas, but the, the one that was the focus for most of your career. Uh, obviously, uh, you've studied international relations. You were an expert on Russia. Uh, you were national security advisor. You were secretary of state. And so you know a great deal about how government form uh, affects international relations and national security specifically. Uh, where do you see the hot spots in the world right now? And what do you think the project can do to help inform policy in that particular area? Well, there are a number of hot spots, uh, and you know, everyone would know them. Uh, what are the Iranians doing as a disruptive power in the Middle East? And the Iranians are quite clearly, even in their own minds, a, a revolutionary power in the Middle East. And so they want to destabilize the status quo. Uh, you look at uh, North Korea, uh, a very dangerous regime. Now, what is uh, consonant, uh, what, what's constant in those cases? You have uh, leadership in the hands essentially of one person, and you are really now subject to the whims of that one person, particularly in the case of North Korea, where uh, it's really more of a syndicate than it is a government. And uh, it's a government or a syndicate that deals in counterfeit dollars, uh, cigarettes, and nuclear materials. So very dangerous to the international system. But the Iranians aren't far behind uh, in their danger to the international system. But I think those are the kinds of threats that we are more accustomed to dealing with. If you're a national security advisor, you fully expect it to be dealing with those kinds of problems. The one that is now front and center is what is going to become of US-China relations, given uh, the fact that we had certain expectations about how China was going to evolve over time. Um, Eddie, you would have been <clears throat> a part of a lot of these discussions. Um, when we were talking about uh, admitting China to the WTO, uh, we did it, of course, well ahead of where Chinese practices and laws were in conformity with WTO practices. And the idea was, all right, this is a huge economy, better to have it inside the tent than outside the tent. I remember I used to have to go and explain to the Russians why they weren't being admitted to the WTO, when in fact, actually their laws and their practices conformed more with WTO mm -hmm. standards on something like intellectual property protection. And mm -hmm. the reason was you had to say, well, basically your economy doesn't matter and the Chinese economy does. Right. And uh, it wasn't always a message you liked delivering, but that really was the case. So we admit China to the, the WTO. The idea is the integration of this freight train, 1.345 billion people uh, growing rapidly, put that inside the tent and it will modify over time. Now we have great disappointment that in fact that didn't take place. And I'm, I'm not now talking about those who believe that somehow uh, integrating China into the international economy was going to turn them into a more liberal political system. There were those who believed that too. As you liberalize the economy, politics would liberalize. But let's mm -hmm. leave that aside. We didn't even get the 
liberalization of the economy that we were expecting. The Chinese uh, did continue to steal intellectual property. Uh, they did uh, continue to privilege national champions over foreign competition. Whole elements of the Chinese economy, whole sectors closed to foreign competition. And so then you got great disappointment about that and you got a backlash that said maybe the only way to deal with this Chinese freight train is to sanction it, uh, to uh, have tariffs against it, uh, to level the playing, playing field, not by bringing China cooperatively in, but by actually punishing China for not having uh, lived up to the expectations. That's really where we are now. Uh, to my mind, it has also uh, been exacerbated by a number of things that Beijing has done. I've told some of my Chinese friends that that speech that Xi Jinping made saying that China was going to surpass the United States in frontier technologies like AI and quantum computing, that was not a very smart speech because it got our backs up. And then you started having people say, well, maybe we shouldn't have Chinese students in labs uh, at places like Stanford. I personally think that would be a mistake, but it, it was a backlash against that statement. We've just seen China's behavior in the coronavirus um, crisis, where they knew things about what was going on, but didn't inform the rest of the world. And as a result of that, the crisis crept up on people in ways that it didn't have to. So the whole, and then you add Hong Kong to that and uh, really starting to reverse the understandings of the 1997 handover with the British. And you've got a pretty big bill of particulars. And I really think um, at a given the criticality of the way China is integrated into the international system, everything from supply chains to uh, separate internets to two technological universes, one free and one not, uh, this is going to be the problem for anyone who wants to govern, anyone who wants to think about foreign policy for probably decades to come. Can I follow on that? Uh, you mentioned Xi Jinping, and uh, when you and I were in the administration, uh, it was a different president. It was President Hu Jintao at the time, and the tone was somewhat different. And uh, I wonder if you'd comment on the importance of personality, obviously, in this case, the leader who's been a, a, a very strong and, from the Chinese point of view, uh, different kind of leader than, than the one we saw. Or how much of it is systemic? How much of this has to do with what you were talking about in your response to the first question when you kind of brought in the issues of liberty uh, and how that uh, affects the way that a system evolves? Yes. Political scientists don't actually like to deal with personality. We, we find it <laughs> kind of hard. <laughs> we don't like to deal with volition. We find that hard. But in this case, I will defend those who say this is really systemic. Uh, this is not just about Xi Jinping's personality. Uh, what has happened is that um, authoritarian regimes have a lot of Achilles heels, but they have two in particular. One is one single point of failure. Right? So if you're going to be omnipotent, you better be omniscient too. And to put all of that power in one person, the last time China had done that was of course with Mao Zedong. And when Deng Xiaoping came to power, he actually started to build a more collective notion of leadership and by the time we were at Jiang Zemin or Hu Jintao, you had at least one other powerful figure who was usually responsible for the government, or for, for the economy, somebody like Zhu Rongji. And so you had some balance. And in fact, the president handled everything else and the premier was able to sort of keep the economic reforms on track. Xi Jinping came in, he did away with that. He decided he was going to chair all important committees. Everybody was going to be beholden to him and you got back to a single point of failure. Secondly, authoritarian regimes have the problem of presidents for life. And the Communist Party had also fixed that. They'd gone to term limits, they'd gone to age limits, 
And so after a couple of terms, you had to go away. And yes, you remained important, but somebody else came. So Jiang Zemin served his two terms. Hu Jintao served his two terms. Xi Jinping comes in and says, there are going to be no limits. And so now you've got a single point of failure and a president for life. I'm often kind of um, amused when I hear uh, what I'll call authoritarian envy. Oh, they build great airports. Oh, they can get things done. It's amazing. We democracies, we're so messy and we don't get anything done. It is true that authoritarians can get things done. But when you have a single point of failure, they will also efficiently carry out bad policy. So the one child policy in China, when the Chinese believed they had an answer to population explosion, they went to the one child policy, efficiently, even brutally carried out. And now 34 million Chinese men don't have mates. Sometimes efficiently carried out bad policy which is I think often the hallmark of authoritarians. I will take the kind of messiness of democracy where you'll have a lot of checkpoints and maybe you won't get as much done, but you also won't make really big mistakes. And I think what is happening in China now is that with Xi Jinping, you've, he's pushed away even the constraints that the Chinese Communist Party was trying to put on authoritarian, its authoritarian regime. Great. Let me shift gears a, a little bit. Um, <clears throat> recent weeks have has uh, witnessed uh, increasing concern with social injustice uh, in general, racism in particular. Uh, how do you see the project as being helpful in understanding issues and helping to move us in a positive direction on that front? Obviously, it's extremely important. The whole country is focused on it right now. I wonder if you could comment on it. Well, let me first say, Eddie, that I, I do believe that this is a time when we can unpack some of the questions of race in America. And we have to do it through difficult conversations. I hope we do it in a way that is not recrimination and self-righteousness, because there's plenty of blame to go around here. But race is different than ethnicity. Um, race goes right to the uh, birth defect of slavery. Uh, I always use the following, um, the, the following fact just because I think it, it just really uh, brings clarity to how visceral an issue this is. My DNA is 40% European. My great grandmother's father was the slave owner. So this is visceral in America. Somehow, if we can, once we have worked through some of the visceral nature of it, if we can start to ask questions about how American institutions can respond to some of the impact of race on outcomes, particularly when you bring race and poverty together in a kind of witch's brew, how do we now from our institutions, not from the institutions of the countries that would consider themselves democratic socialists, most of, most of which, by the way, are small and homogeneous. Um, I had somebody the other day talking, about, uh, talking to me about child poverty rates and uh, the US has the highest child poverty rate in the OECD. And I look, you look at the list of the OECD and you think you're comparing us to Sweden and Finland and Norway and Austria. So we have to recognize that the United States is geographically dispersed, federal in its governance, and highly diverse. So high, how in that set of characteristics do we deal the, use the institutions that we have to deal with the impact of race and poverty on outcomes? Uh, my own view is that one of the essential ones we've got to get right pretty soon uh, we've got to get right right away is education because the impact on of education on then people's prospects down the road is really the biggest intervention we've ever had against poverty or even for that matter, matter against prejudice. I grew up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama. My parents were educators. I'm not even the first PhD in my family. My aunt 
Teresa is a PhD and was a PhD in Victorian literature of all things. She wrote books on Dickens. You think what I do is kind of weird for a black person. She wrote books on <laughs> Dickens. For so in our family, education was the Holy Grail. But it was actually explicitly a shield, not a perfect shield, but a shield against a prejudiced world. And so education we've got to get right. And the truth of the matter is right now, I can look at your zip code and I can tell whether you're gonna get a good education. Minority children in a poor environment and, and just think of what COVID has reinforced here. If you are a parent who is educated, you can help your child at home with that remote learning. If you're a poor kid whose parents perhaps don't even speak the language, your learning loss is going to be so much greater. And when I hear the debates about should we open schools, I think that the kids who are most at risk if we don't are actually kids who don't have a home environment where in fact the school is the environment in which they get out and have a chance. And so um, I think that's how we can be helpful. We can really look at our institutions. I'm, I'm the first to say, this is about capitalism and socialism and other forms of government. I'm the first to say, I see no alternative. I don't even wanna try an alternative to markets, to individual um, choice. I don't even wanna try it. I do want to admit that late stage capitalism is showing its age and that there are some dysfunctions, particularly in the social contract that has to underlie capitalism. The fact is capitalism um, markets will reward some things and not others. And so it's inherently unequal. Now, if it's unequal because of talent, we can accept that. So none of us is particularly angry that LeBron James or Tom Brady makes a lot of money because we know we can't do that. On the other hand, if it's inequality of access or opportunity, now you get the politics of jealousy. And now you get the kind of populist response, which is it's their fault that you're not doing well. And so I think we have a lot of work to do uh, to take our system and say what needs to be looked at to be responsive to some of these dysfunctions that are there. Let me just uh, ask you one final question, then I'm going to turn it over to Scott so that he can ask some questions from the audience. Uh, one of the th you mentioned kids, uh, kids in school. I'm thinking of kids that are a little more grown up. My kid is now in her young 30s. And that generation seems to have a very different view of capitalism and socialism from some of those who are my generation and even your generation, Condi. Um, uh, and I I'm wondering if you'd comment on that. I mean, part of it may be from uh, the fact that they didn't see the history, they weren't around when the Soviet Union was there. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, tell us what lessons there are and how we can communicate to that generation in a more effective way. Right, and by the way, Eddie, we're pretty much in the same generation. Just <laughs> just <laughs> well, we don't look at it. Right. Look at it so. <laughs> we have to do, uh, we have to understand three things in order to understand this uh, fascination with flirtation with socialism. Uh, first of all, people define socialism in ways that it starts to sound pretty good. Um, I will give as I, I have certain talents I'll give and you can take from me what, uh, what you need and give to me what I need. It, it sounds pretty good. And, and we tend to think of it as collectivist and everybody's going to benefit and so forth. And then people say things like, well, we're really talking about Denmark. We're not talking about the Soviet Union. We're talking about Denmark. Well, Denmark's pretty homogeneous, pretty small. So you say to people, even if you want to give it its best light, which is a small, as a friend of mine said, a, a small uh, Nordic country that's homogeneous and has no big international responsibilities, even if you wanted to give it that, um, let's not say that that's what's going to work in the United States. Secondly, 
people have forgotten the Soviet Union. I, I was in a class recently and I was, uh, the young woman was giving a presentation and she kept saying Brezhnev. And I thought, why does she not know that it's Brezhnev? And I thought, well, because she's probably never heard his name. And so I said to them, how many of you were born when the Soviet Union collapsed? Mm -hmm. Not a single one. So they don't know that history. And the final thing is, Perhaps, and, and here I would say it may be a little bit the fault of, of those of us who really do believe in markets, kind of, let's call it center right, to be defensive about some of the problems that do exist, rather than saying, yes, these problems exist, but they can be resolved within a capitalist framework, rather than pretending that the problems don't exist. We do have problems of income inequality. We do have problems of less mobility than people once had. Uh, how are we going to actually address those? We do have uh, increasing automation that is uh, chasing all kinds of uh, jobs categories uh, out of the United States and to uh, other places. They're not coming back. What are going to be our answers to that? And I think if we were to look at these as federalist issues, so I'll just give you one example. We have, I think, 36 or 37 jobs training programs, federal jobs training programs. I don't know anybody who thinks a single one of them works. Right. Maybe we're going to block grant that money back to the states because what it takes to train in Alabama and Texas and Vermont is different. But we haven't really been uh, willing to, uh, to talk about market-oriented capitalist solutions to some of the dysfunctions that are truly there. And so I think the kids, uh, the kids say, well, if you don't have any solutions, I'll try this one over here that sounds pretty good. Great, thank you. All right, Scott, let me uh, turn it over to you. And uh, if you'd be willing to ask some of the questions that were sent in, please. Sure, we already have a bunch of questions here uh, prompted by that really great discussion. Uh, one is, uh, from Mike, who would like to have you discuss common goods. Uh, these are things like uh, pollution that affect us all, but that private enterprise might, might not take into account. How do we get them to act in ways that more benefit society in general? It's a very good question, Mike. And um, I think that the answer is not, well, the government has to dictate it. That, that was my point about the Soviet Union and environment. Uh, they've not actually done very, very well. Uh, but uh, it does mean that you have to get various stakeholders to be responsible about uh, common goods. And let's, let's take the environment uh, as an example. Um, so we want to do three things in order to, to uh, be responsible in this room. We've, we've still got to grow the economy. We want to be environmentally, uh, environmentally responsible. And we want to get an energy mix that helps us to do both. Now, where are those solutions likely to come from? They're actually not likely to come from the government. They're likely either to come from entrepreneurs who have a new idea about how to get energy mix that helps on environmental sustainability and economic growth, or we get corporations to take this as a part of their concern so that they're actually rich. So I've said to my European fans very often, so who's actually come up with the first really, really popular electric car? That would be the United States and it would be called Tesla. So uh, very often, if you put the right incentives out there, and I think those incentives, by the way, are not just financial incentives. I think reputational incentives matter these days to corporations. Nobody wants to be called a polluter. Uh, reputational uh, matters, uh, it matters with your stockholders. Um, Eddie mentioned young people. Young people want to work for companies that they believe are socially responsible. And so I think there are a lot of, a lot of factors that are driving uh, corporations to want to be more a part of the common goods project than in the past. I don't hear too many corporations saying anymore, I don't care, about, I'm just gonna automate my workforce out of existence. Uh, they talk more and more about job skills mismatches and how do we deal with that. 
So I think corporations can be partners in the common goods enterprise and will actually get faster action and more effective action uh, than if we try to do it through some kind of collective idea from Washington. Okay, uh, I, I'm gonna combine a couple of questions from several people here. Uh, Lewis and Jeff ask, why is this debate even going on given that so many countries chose to reject socialism around 1990? Why is it that so many still believe socialism has better outcomes? And the, uh, the question that sort of is more directly uh, related is Peggy wants to know whether you believe that public schooling actually teaches and potentially fosters socialism? And if so, what's the solution? Very clearly, the reason people are having this debate, I think, is because uh, they aren't confronted with the facts. And so I actually think projects like this where we really, as you said at the beginning in your introduction, uh, where we actually uh, look at outcomes, we look at healthcare outcomes, we look at educational outcomes, and so on and so on. Um, I, I would rather say to people, um, instead of saying, don't you see that socialism doesn't work, let's take a look at the data on what actually happened when we had socialist experiments. I also do think that we have to deal with the small uh, Nordic homogeneous country also that might have more government involvement, but looks very different than a, a hugely diverse geographically dispersed United States. Um, I do think that in our schools, um, and maybe not just public schools, um, I know some of what's going on in some private schools as well. And um, the tendency to criticize what's going on in the United States without comparable uh, examples from what's going on elsewhere is one that is unfortunately kind of rampant in our educational system. I, I can be, I want to be a big critic of the United States of America because I want to expect more of my country. But I also want to understand where it fits in the pantheon of other countries. I'll give you one example. We were talking about race earlier. The Brazilians used to claim that they had no race problem. Um, and yet you would notice if you went to Brazil, the field hands were African, the hotel staffs were mulatto, and the government was Portuguese, but they didn't have a race problem. When Lula became president, he, we actually had this discussion and he said, I've got to break through this notion that we don't have a race problem. And he then brought on his first Afro-Brazilian minister, first one. This is when I'm Secretary of State. First one. Now, how long back in history had it been that the United States had had African-American secretaries of, of departments? We'd had two African secretary, African-American secretaries of state by this time. And so he said to me, I want you to come and I want you to go to the Afro-Brazilian homeland of Salvador Bahia, because I want them to see what's possible. So let's never forget that we are indeed a flawed society very flawed. Uh, I'm religious. My, my grandmother used to say the only human being that wasn't flawed was Jesus Christ, and that's because he was God. So let's say that we are flawed, but let's teach our kids that human institutions are all flawed. And the test of a country is, are you addressing your flaws? That's a great, uh, it's a great answer. Uh, two more questions. Take, yeah, okay, you've got, I you got can take two more, that's fine. Go ahead, we'll see how it goes, Scott. All right, <laughs> I'm watching the clock. <laughs> Hate to shortchange the audience here, so. Right. You know, uh, Rick says something specific. He wants to know whether the law does or should favor the educated and propertied over a larger, more general electorate that is prescribed by democracy itself? 
Well, there was once a time in our history where it actually did favor uh, the property. You had to have property in order to vote. I think we've, we've gotten away from that. Look, I do not think any law should favor um, those who are property, those who are, are wealthy. Uh, it's why I'm a major believer in uh, getting people to understand why it's important to vote wherever you are in, in life, whatever your station in life. Um, I'm a big believer of going into communities that are underserved and, and getting people to see they ought to work in campaigns. I really don't care who they work for. I just want them to work in work the political system. And I think we have a history actually of saying that our laws and our institutions have sometimes, when they're at their best, actually been the vehicle for remediation. So when I think of Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up, where I couldn't go to a movie theater or to a restaurant when I was a kid, because of Jim Crow laws. I think, how did it change? Well, yes, there were the protests in the streets and uh, I was growing up in Birmingham when there were the protests in Kelly Ingram Park and Bull Connor and his police dogs, absolutely. But there was also Thurgood Marshall and his group, which all the way from 1937 was deciding every Friday morning which cases to take to the Supreme Court to try to undo Jim Crow laws. So they were using the institutions and so if I had one thing to say to people who want to make change, yes, it's fine to, to raise the temperature around issues, but we actually have institutions that through a constitution that once counted my ancestors as three-fifths of a man, actually became a vehicle for returning some rights to the descendants of slaves. And so um, I think our institutions can actually work in that way. Go ahead, Scott, take another one. With one more, yeah. Yeah, please. Graydon uh, would like you to discuss sort of the evolution of your own personal views on capitalism and socialism over your lifetime. My, my personal views, for sure to remember, I, I spent a lot of my college years as a music major. These issues were actually not on the table <laughs> if you were mostly worried about Mozart. But when I first encountered the issues, like any young person, I think, I thought, well, maybe these collectivist responses might make some sense. But I had the great advantage of being a, the first place that I really studied was the Soviet Union. And I remember going to the Soviet Union for the first time in 1979 to do language training. And uh, I had kind of ideas about, you know, what it might be. And going to, and, and since I studied the military, you know, it was a powerful technological force and so forth and so on. And I remember going to the Goom department store for the first time, buying something and having it rung up on an abacus and thinking, okay. And as I lived there for five years in language, uh, five, uh, five months in language training, felt like five years, five months in language training and realizing what a miserable society this was and realizing that people looked at their feet when they walked along. They had no energy, they were beaten down. They were afraid to say anything. And it wasn't long for me before the idea that the thing I most wanted my government to do was to protect my right to say what I thought, to be free from the knock of the secret police at night, to be free from the arbitrary power of the state, to worship as I pleased, and to have the right to, and, uh, to be uh, educated so that I could prosper. And that's all I wanted from my government. And I think um, being in the Soviet Union so young in my years, is 22 years old, probably had a lot to do with that. Okay, thanks, Condi. That's all so well said, as always, and I'll hand it over to uh, Ed to finish up. Great. Well, thank you very much, Condi. This was fabulous. I'm sure the uh, audience very much appreciates your insight. It was uh, not only enlightening, but also a lot of fun to hear you talk. So thank you again for uh, spending the time to do this. Um, just as a preview of where we're going, uh, this is the first in our series on the Human Prosperity Project. Uh, and over the next few weeks, we will have additional uh, seminars, webinars on personal freedom and the moral case for capitalism. That'll be on July 23rd. On August 6th, we'll be talking about liberty and federalism. 
And then on August 20th, uh, opportunity and income inequality. These are all issues that you touched on in, in your comments. So uh, hopefully the audience uh, will be interested in following along with some of these uh, and, and we look forward to having you. Uh, we thank the audience for participating. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, I'd like to thank my uh, co-project, Ted Scott. Uh, it's been a lot of fun working with him and uh, we've got a ways to go, but we're, we're hoping that we're gonna make some pro progress on this. So thanks very much to all.